What's up, everybody? Facebook freezes for a second, so if I'm just looking at you all retarded, <laughs> not even sure it's working. Weekly Q&A, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, Frankie Finn proudly brings to you our weekly Q&A. Got some really good questions this week, by the way. You guys are working on some, some cool things. I'm always really stoked when I see awesome questions coming in the inbox. And uh, just a little shout out for those of you guys who've uh, reached out and have some I'll just send you the video. You don't have to like jump on the phone with me and go through sales. You can just look at it and decide on your own. Um, or if you just want to know like price and stuff like that, it's all there in that video. So let me know. Other than that, let's get into the Q and A. All right. Hannah says, I'm having a nightmare with the ads and the iOS 14 stuff. Anyone else? I've got client ads paused. I'm so confused with what to do to fix it. I verified domains, get, got permissions, but I still can't set up the events to go uh, to get the ads to run. Anyone? I'm assuming, Hannah, that what you mean is like a tracking issue because everybody's having the same kind of tracking problems with iOS. I'm having the same thing, by the way. I'll tell you one of the things that helped me uh, many, many years ago, I, I followed a guy who, uh, some of you guys will know his name, he, he ran something called Brad's Ads, and he used to talk a lot about how like people would split test billions of variations and run what he called a lot of mediocre ads, and then those mediocre ads would perform mediocre, and, and they would say, we need to test more of this and one more variables, and he focused on coming up with one really great ad and one really great offer and one really great message and then put that out there and use that as the basis for scale. And I started doing that in my practice. And the first time I did this, it took me three days to write my first ad. But I'll tell you, it's made the tracking so, so much easier with or without iOS because now I'm not trying to properly track 45 things. I'm tracking one or two campaigns and they're different offers that go to different places. So even if Facebook doesn't credit them perfectly, um, you know, it's a lot easier. Now, having said that, if I was in an e-commerce niche, which you may be, I honestly don't know what I would do. You might be a little screwed. You might have to, to check out something like Heroes from, from Alex Becker and get some like more advanced tracking in place. I honestly don't know. I, I've heard really good things about that. But otherwise, if you're selling like, you know, some kind of Because you can just go log into your AWeb or you can go log into your form and see how many clients have submitted. So you don't need all the, the tracking that comes with Facebook to do it all for you. Um, so that's my best suggestion on it right now. Obviously, that's still evolving. So I'll probably have some more to say on that as we go. Here's some birds in the backyard. Uh, Daryl. Hey, everyone. I'm new to the group. Doing PPC marketing and focusing on Google Ads right now, I have two basic questions. Is it valuable to be Google Ads certified when reaching out to clients? Do they care? Two, for entry-level experience, what would you just suggest is a good hourly flat fee or percentage of ad spend to manage an account? Thanks in advance. Daryl, firstly, is it valuable to be Google Ads certified when reaching out to clients? Do they care? I'm not going to say it makes like 0% difference, but it makes like a small like 0.1% difference. Like I, I actually got certified many, many, many years ago by Ryan Dice's organization. It was some, somebody else paid for it and we were at the conference and I went through and got it. And so far in all of human history, nobody's ever asked me for my certifications. Um, so the biggest certification is like, can you actually help somebody? That's what they care about most, by the way. If the certification indicates that you can help them, they might care about that, um, but generally no. And as far as your second question, What's a good hourly flat fee or percentage of ad spend? This is more of a loaded question about like pricing and when you're getting started, to be honest, you're, you're probably just going to be in a situation where your clients are going to say, here's how much we're willing to pay and you're probably going to have to take it. But in general, like pricing fluctuates based on mostly the biggest thing that's going to make a difference is who you're running ads for and what kind of results you can get for them. So I'm going to work within your framework and assume you're charging hourly or a flat fee, which by the way, I don't suggest you do, but let's just say you are because you, you asked for it. If I'm running at and you know, I'm managing their campaigns and it's 50 bucks an hour, I don't know what I'm doing if I'm only charging 50 bucks an hour. You go to a local business and you tell them like a small little brick and mortar, uh, 
brick and mortar mom and pop shop and tell them you charge 50 bucks an hour they may think that's astronomical because they don't have any employees at that price so a big factor is actually who you're running the ads for and and ultimately what value you're bringing to the table so the biggest thing you can do if you want to increase how much you're going to charge regardless of what price structure start thinking about who you can contribute the most value to and then what you'll find is that your price will fluctuate with that but having said that in the beginning this is just kind of how it goes for everybody is usually your first couple of jobs usually you'll say hey i charge this much and they'll either say okay which means you underpriced yourself or they're going to say well we can only afford this much and you say okay well i'll do it for that much because you're trying to to learn it and get paid learning how to do it so that's more than likely what's going to happen in your situation muhammad what should be the best reply? Uh, this person sent me, here's the message the, the person said, appreciated. Checking with a few other companies about the price, we'll get back to you soon. Mohammed, what most people would tell you is like, you got to get better at the sales and the objection handling to make that price irrelevant. But I'm, a, I'm of a different philosophy. I'm of the philosophy that they're telling you, I can buy your shit elsewhere. So there's a deeper underlying problem, which is you don't want them to be able to buy your shit elsewhere. And so the real solution is to create what I call a mini monopoly where you can be the only source where they can get that. And sometimes it just takes tweaking a little bit. Like you, you only have to be five or 10, 10% different than everybody else. Like uh, your system just has to be unique enough that they can't just go and get it down the street. And then what will happen is you won't face that objection because there is nobody to price shop you against. So I know most people would say, get really good at handling the price subject and all those things and, and dig in like that. Telling you that you need to tweak your offer and make it unique enough that you just won't face that again in the future. So I don't have any short-term advice on how to do it, but on the long term, like tweak your offer so you never have to deal with that again. Mini monopoly is what you want to think about. Um, Taylor, hey, I run a marketing agency and Facebook has decided to disable our business manager for no reason. Facebook live chat have said if you request an appeal, there shouldn't be a problem getting it back. We now cannot manage our client ad accounts. However, my business relies too heavily on Facebook ads as a service we provide for our clients, and we cannot have this happen. Is there any way of getting a Facebook rep? Um, Taylor, usually you got to spend a certain amount to get a Facebook rep. I forget the exact amount, but if you're not there now, you're probably not just going to suddenly get them. Um, obviously, there's a couple of things I'm going to tell you. Your real issue, by the way, is the underlying thing is that you said you're way too heavily reliant on Facebook. Facebook ads, that's actually the bigger thing because if, if Facebook can turn off your whole business, then you don't really have a business. You have like a, a, a way to exploit Facebook ads. But I'll tell you like long term, firstly, short term, appeal it and appeal it again and again and again and again because each time you appeal it, you get a different person. And so um, if you're interested, by the way, we have a script that can help you do it. I, I don't guarantee that it works because I'm not the Zuckerberg, but it's worked for a lot of people who've used it. Try it. But long term, you want to think about diversifying your sources so like maybe that's youtube ads or maybe that's adwords or maybe that's old-fashioned like um you know direct mail and then the third thing is always be converting your traffic to traffic you control your list your audience that's how you're ultimately going to get less dependent on facebook and this is what you want to ultimately do for your clients so they're not dependent on facebook ads as well uh joseph has anyone ever run linkedin ads yes uh not a ton joseph they tend to be more expensive and they also and if it doesn't work on another platform it's probably not going to work um, the question implies that like the platform itself is what makes the difference and platforms definitely make a difference but they're they're you know a small part what makes a difference like if it, we found if we have an offer that works on facebook i can go to a conference run that same offer i can run it on linkedin it'll work i can you know message people in a group it'll work so uh if it's if what you've got is working other places then yeah try out linkedin if it's not i would not suggest using their expensive ads as a way to figure it out but it's a great way to, to be somewhere where most of your competition isn't i don't, actually don't know why they're so much more expensive but they just are compared to at least Facebook anyways, and like Google Display and YouTube and some of the other options. Um, but yeah, Stephanie. Hey everyone, I have a question about branding and how to appeal to clients. 
I'm doing some research. I'm thinking of niching down. I have a strong passion for the environment, and I want to be able to support brands that are environmentally conscious. Right now, my branding is very bold and colorful. Do you think I should change my branding to the typical brand colors of green, beige, brown in order to fit in with my target market? Uh, Stephanie, the short answer to your question is yes, you probably want to match the interest of your target market. But having said that, your question implies that what's going to make the difference are your colors and your logos and things like that. And those are like 1% of the deal. What you actually said about like wanting to appeal to environmentally conscious businesses is actually what I would roll with because your messaging is going to be far more important for who you're going to rein in, the, the sort of bait you use to fish with. Like nobody's going to say like, hey, they're a terrible company, but I love their logo. Um, and on the flip side of that, I've sold a lot of things through really ugly websites, like uh, websites that you would think are too ugly that nobody would ever buy, no branding, look like shit, but ultimately the message is really, really strong. And so that's what you want to do is have like a really strong message that's very clearly for your people, which in your case is that the environmental. Whatever you want to go with. Uh, Jonathan. Uh, I missed this one, by the way, on your comment earlier, so sorry about that. Can you g give me a good exa an example of a good offer for a marketing agency trying to get bathroom remodeling clients? Um, so, Jonathan, I've seen this a few times. Though. So, there's a, I'll give you a really simple example. Um, is There's a, a company in my like hometown area just across the border in America in Detroit, Michigan, that runs a lot of like... We'll remodel your kitchen for 2999 It's like a set package, and obviously there's limitations on the offer. They're not going to do like a, the world's biggest kitchen, but you get like a set package. And I'll tell you the biggest thing that stops people from selling in that niche is that like just the unknown, like, and it's a hassle to find out how much it's going to cost. You got to bring somebody in and get a quote, and half the time they don't show up and they don't call you back. So like if, if I can just call somebody up and know it's going to be like, Three grand, no hidden fees, blah, blah, blah. Like that alone is going to sell you a lot of like whatever that equivalent of that is in bathroom remodeling. And then you can always step up the offer with like little things. So I've seen people do like uh, uh, you can get a Starbucks gift card for those kind of things. Or they'll send you to a restaurant where you guys can go to eat because they know you're going to be out of the house while they're doing the remodeling. So they make sure to take care of restaurant reservations and things like that. So those are like the coolest offers that I've seen at work. But again, it's like, it's, it's, it's only limited by your creativity, but I'll tell you the biggest thing, the biggest obstacles to the sale in that is like, and I'll tell you that just as somebody who's actually like been shopping for those kind of things is I got to call people up and then you got to have like 10 minute conversation and then they got to come in for a quote and there's got to be some time and then they look at it. Uh, the best ones are just like, here, we offer a package, it's a flat fee, or we're going to get it done and just keep the process really, really simple. How do we get started? And you can see what you're buying on the website or whatever. So that'll make a huge difference for you if you do something like that. Uh, and obviously, you got to get away from customizing every job, which a lot of people think they need to do, but you don't. Um, Aaron. I have clients that are waiting to work, w wanting us to work to generate leads. Till now, we've only worked with them to set up their website and CRM and build automation scripts and playbooks. How are you all charging for this kind of lead? And that's a, that is a big, big kind of broad question. I guess it depends on what kind of niche you're in. You can either charge flat rate, you can charge retainer, you can charge pay per for, sh for show up. Uh, all of those have kind of ups and downs. It, it'll depend a little bit on your niche, like a lead in one might be 30 bucks a lead in another niche might be 3,000 it depends who you're generating the leads for and also the retainers are going to vary largely based on who you're doing you could be doing 500 bucks to, to run a monthly lead package to tens of thousands of dollars or even more depending on how big the client is so it's hard to say without any details but um, you know I would suggest just give it a try let them know that you're like learning the ropes on this and that uh, um, ultimately, once you get it working, though, it's always better to be paid on performance. But at the start, it might be better to be paid on retainer and figure it out and all the challenges while you do that. Melissa, does anyone specialize in attorneys? Could you tell me what you charge solo practitioners for SEO and websites and what you charge medium to large firms? Um, don't necessarily know about websites, but I can tell you about SEO, Melissa. I, I suspect... Uh, websites are probably in the three to five K range. If I had to guess, that's probably typical. Solo practitioners, by the way, have the least amount of money and they're the worst at closing deals because they, you know, they have to work most of the
Gonna get the least amount of money. That's probably in like the 500 to 2,000 range. The really big firms usually in their SEO, they're usually paying anywhere from like five to 20k um, typically. So it depends on who you're working with. And then the medium firms would obviously be somewhere in the middle. And obviously, you know, it, it varies a little bit with client to client. But that's just to give you a ballpark of, of what's going on. And I would say that's probably true in most niches. Is that there's always like a low end scraping by kind of person and those people are cool people but i generally don't suggest you build a business around them uh they're they're always going to pay you the least and then there's going to be a high end that's looking for a really premium thing as uh, our man oral talked about he said it's like the equivalent of being like a call girl you can be the 50 dollars street hooker who you know uh has to churn and burn through clients and have a lot of them and leaves people kind of feeling unfulfilled and just another name and number uh, and it doesn't really, nobody really likes that arrangement, but it's cheap. Or you can be like the high class call girl who charges thousands a night, has a short list of clients and, uh, and they really respect them. And she has the time to prepare a great experience and get ready. And she can be very selective. I know you probably don't want to be a prostitute, but I'm just giving you the analogy because I thought it was a good one. TJ, is Fiverr better than Upwork to hire freelancers? TJ, depends really on one big thing. I'll tell you. Fiverr is better for one-off jobs. I never, like if I'm just hiring for a one-off and I know it's a one-off, I go straight to Fiverr. Upwork's too complicated for one-offs and I just look for people offering that gig. I think Upwork's better when you're looking for like ongoing, more meaningful relationships and you know you might potentially have repeat business. Um, so it depends on what you're doing. If the project's one-off, go to you know, Upwork. But there's other places, by the way, you can you can hire people besides those two websites, onlinejobs.ph for freelancers uh, or for like virtual assistants. And as well, let's go on almost any Facebook group and just post that you're looking to find people, salespeople or whatever, and they'll usually come to you. So don't limit to yourself just to those two places. Think about where the best people already are and go there. Uh, last question, Douglas. Question for the other agencies out there. When you sign some up for a monthly retainer, do you start their 30 days of management from date of onboarding completion, the point everything is set up and running and ads are running, or the date the contract is signed regardless of how long things take to get started? For instance, if it takes two weeks to get the Facebook to access because of locked account. I've seen all three, Douglas. This is just so it's kind of like preference for me. Um, whenever I've done that kind of work, I personally don't start charging the client until everything's set up. But we're also like really good at doing the setup in under an hour. I know Facebook's making it more and more complicated by the day with domain verification. Not everybody has access to their website and stuff like that. But I would say in general, the best place like for the longevity of the client is probably to start charging them when you're managing the actual ads, um, just as a general rule. Although having said that, like if they're cool with setup fees and all that, there's lots of different ways you can that so um, just depends on you and like I said at the uh, the end of this for those of you guys who are interested in the, um, the mastermind I created a little 20 something 22 minute video or something like that so if you're interested pricing details like that just shoot me a message I'll send you the video um, that's it there's nobody to talk to I might ask you a question or two just to make sure you're a fit so you know I'll say 22 minutes of watching it if it's not uh, but other than that and make sure to subscribe on youtube we're actually slowly growing there's more than six people now so uh, you might you might get left out on the train i'm adding a little bit more goofiness and entertainment and same great insights as usual from 14 15 years of running an agency so i hope that's helpful to you guys that's all i got for you today may the force be with you